All right, everyone. Well, welcome to today's Talk with Doc. Uh, it's my honor. Uh, got my friend David Glover uh, with Pure Ministries joining us. And today we have a topic that I think is a very timely topic, topic for us to uh, deal with. And it's how to deal with those who don't know how to deal with disabilities, um, especially as we're coming into the holiday season. And we're going to be with so many of our family and friends who may not just understand our, our kids, our friends who, who have disabilities. So we're going to be talking today on just how we can, can work with them and how we can help them understand and, and just make life easier. So uh, with that, welcome, David. Why don't you take a minute and introduce yourself? Sure, about all the wonderful things you do with Peer Ministry as well. <laughs> well, I don't know about that, but uh, I am a uh, pure granddad. And uh, just a little bit about me is that I was um, living large, living life, uh, uh, enjoying my children and um, found myself in uh, 1994 uh, being able to sell our company and retire. And I retired in 1996 at the ripe young age of 47 and didn't know exactly what I was going to do with my life. Um, but, but I think it's interesting to know that um, had someone asked me if I knew Jesus at the point, I said, oh yeah, we were, we were doing all that. We had all the boxes checked. I was taking, um, missionary groups to the Amazon, uh, to Russia, uh, to places around the world. I was very involved in my church. I was chairing of my deacons. I was right in there. And, uh, it's like God around 1996, when I quit working, uh, told me, he said, yeah, I'm going to do something in your life that's going to draw you to me like never before. And I'd say, oh boy, give me that. Well, what it turned out to be in 1998 was the birth of my first grandson, Zachariah. And uh, God used Zachariah to draw me to him and uh, in a special way. And Zach was born with all kinds of disabilities um, and um, unexpectedly, and I say this unexpectedly, he died at four and a half. And, uh, but in those four and a half years, my life was transformed. And again, God used this little boy who I like to say, who never took a step or said a word to spread the gospel in ways that, that I could never and could touch me in ways that only he could. And so with that, uh, how we started Pure Ministries is um, we discovered that when Zach was born, even though I was, you know, we're very involved in my church and my daughter and her husband went there and uh, we taught a young married class. What we found was the church, uh, it was a great church, uh, about a thousand members, was really totally unprepared to deal with a family with special needs. Um, and I, what I discovered, and I hope you'll identify with this, I discovered that in the church, uh, when people deal with a tragedy or something that they consider a tragedy, they're good for about two weeks. Uh, and they'll bring you fried chicken and potato salad and cakes for about two weeks. And then it's time to get on with life. And as we all know, with disability, um, life goes on. But the church was not prepared really to deal with us. And so what I saw over a period of time was my daughter and my son-in-law sort of slowly get um, left out of the life of the church. And then when they brought Zach to church, they really didn't know what to do with Zach as he grew a little bit older. They just didn't know what to do with him. And he did. He had cerebral palsy. He was blind and he had seizures. Uh, but he was beautiful. If you look at him, you never know any of that. Right. Uh, but I saw my daughter and then start to slip away. And uh, and and it was it wasn't anything cruel or anything, but people just, you know, they just got back from the hospital and they won't want to go to this party because, you know, they just got home. And so uh, systematically, slowly, they got excluded from the fellowship. And I started seeing that, you know, the church, maybe we're just unique. Maybe we did something wrong. Uh, and then God showed me, you know, no, no, no. Uh, this is a common problem. And I got out and we started Pure Ministries with one purpose in mind. And that was to uh, help uh, identify and show churches uh, not necessarily how to do it, but scriptural commands to do it. And the fact is, is we profess to be Christians. This is something we do. And also just to awaken the church to the blessing of having 
people with disabilities and families with disabilities in their fellowships and what churches had to do to make that happen. And so that's why we formed Pure Ministries with that being a, a singular goal to just go into churches and make them aware and quote unquote train them how to include families affected by disabilities. And, and that's what we tried to do. And uh, God's blessed us uh, up until the COVID time where, you know, we just, this has been a, been a difficult time for everybody. But in our right. ministry, we lived on the fact of getting out into churches and speaking and uh, preaching about this message. And um, so that's what we do. Pure Ministries is that's what we're here to do. Yeah. So absolutely love it. And we, we, we share a common common goal and common heart with at SOAR with you with that and fully uh, agree and, and, and love your, your vision and passion there. And, and uh, I, I can completely relate to everything you're talking about with, with your grandson, obviously having gone through that personally with my own son and, and the death of him and, and seeing uh, the same things with, with the church and just how church isn't there. And, and so many people just don't know how, uh, to communicate. And when you do have a, a child with disability, um, they're afraid. Um, and, and, you know, anymore, if you don't know something or you don't understand something, it's a lot easier to, to back away. And people just tell themselves, well, I'm, I'm helping out by not saying anything because I don't want to say the wrong things or do the wrong things. You know, Doc, it's really interesting you're saying that because, um, the things we're going to talk about today were the things I was going to do in the seminar or out there in the conference. Um, but, you know, that's really the position that many people take is mm -hmm. that, you know, I don't know exactly what to say and therefore I'll say nothing. I don't know exactly what right. to do. Therefore I do. But, you know, if you look at that and, and I spent a lot of time there on this seminar, you know, really what that is, it's an issue of our pride. Yeah. It's not pride overriding our call to minister, our call to be friends, our call to be loving. We let pride affect us. You know, we don't want to look bad. Therefore, we do nothing. So right. we're taking ourselves, our own feelings is more important than doing something, loving somebody. And I tell people all the time, you, you, however you love people, um, do it. You know, right. just, you, may, you may screw up, you know, but the fact that you pay attention and you try to do something, uh, God will start directing you about how to do it. And so um, it, it's just a common thing, you know, and I particularly, uh, you know, it's just not just, you know, people in churches too, and I'm in churches all over, you know, that, the, the mindset is, you know, we're not prepared. They can come up with a million excuses why. You know, we're just not prepared to do it. We don't have enough room. We don't have enough staff. We don't have enough money. We don't. So we'll just let the church down the street do it. Right. And that church down the street, unfortunately, is saying, you know, we can't do it either. So we'll let that church up there, up the street do it. And so eventually um, nothing gets done. And you know this, if you're dealing with special needs family, uh, I don't know what the percentages are. I don't know what the statistics are, but Johnny and friends did some things a few years ago. Um, and the statistics, I don't know, a great majority of families affected by special needs are not in churches. Yep. And, uh, yeah, the I'm, number right now is 90%. And, and that's just... You know, and, and, and if you go into us, people say, I don't believe that. But if you go into a secular grouping of parents, and if you mention something about their church, you'll hear snickers. You'll hear people, you know, laughing under their breath because they tried to go to first church. And the problem was, you know, people saw them. They saw them coming to the door and say, you know, something different here. And so everybody sort of runs around with like they're in the South here, we say with their Hit like a chicken with their head cut off and they make that person they're not aware of it they don't know what to do and that person feels awkward and they're saying they came there because they know you know they may not have been christians at all may not have been in church so we know if we go to church those people don't know what to do they're supposed to be loving supposed to be caring and then when they go being totally unprepared uh, they just give the impression that they're being bothered by having you here because you don't fit into the category. And I always right. use an example, if you're sitting in a window and you see a family drive up in the parking lot and you see a young couple and they've got a 10 year old boy and a five year old girl come out, you've got them slotted into your church. You know, where they go, you can take them to their Sunday school room and glad you're here and everything. But if you see a family get out, say, and they just have, they have a son who looks like he's 15 or 16 
and he's holding his dad's hand coming into church everybody goes crazy what what are we going to do we're not sure what's going to happen we're not sure and so just a little bit of preparation primarily of people's hearts that would reflect their welcoming attitude to people goes a long way for that family as they walk in those doors absolutely so, so anyway. absolutely yeah no I, I agree you know the and the only other thing i'd say is you know as, as a parent i can't tell you the number of times i've had complete strangers tell me i'm not just a bad parent but i'm a horrible parent because my son's had an autistic meltdown and uh, they they think it's bad parenting because of that and and you know it comes back to whether you're um a friend or whether you're at a church or wherever it's at you know it, it again this whole it's this lack of education lack of understanding mm -hmm. Everyone says, well, I don't understand autism, or I don't understand Dan Sender, I don't understand cerebral palsy, or I don't understand intellectual disabilities. You don't have to understand them. I, and what I say all the time, I don't know a single parent who was given an instruction manual when their child was born with that how happened. to do it. it. How do you learn about it? By loving them, by being willing to be a friend. That's what I tell everyone. If you're willing to be a friend, that's all it takes. That's the only requirement to, to be there. And you'll learn. And these individuals have so much love to give. And I always promise you'll be blessed. So, so with that, let me kind of hand off to you and and go ahead and share what you've got. But you know, I, I hope today's gonna really open the eyes of, of a lot of people in realizing um, that first off, you don't need to be an expert in wow. disabilities to welcome and befriend someone or a family with a disability. Um, it, it just starts with simply being willing to be a friend and be there for them. You know, it's uh, you know, just you're saying that. And um, I believe that the average person, if you'd asked me before Zach was born, maybe before your son was born, somebody asked you, uh, people think that when a child is born to a couple, that somehow there is an instruction manual that comes and said, okay, now you know everything about it. And people think that. They really believe that. Right. And worse than that is that people, even Christians and churches, think that I really don't have any responsibility. That's special needs parents' job and special needs teachers. They're the ones that interact with this person. I don't have to as a Christian. I don't have to. I can be comfortable in my own little world. Mm -hmm. And that's exactly where I was. I wasn't being mean. I just, but after Zach was born, I realized that was me. You know, and so that's where people are, which get out. You know, I just want to start, I guess, today and to mention um, people talk about pure ministries. And one thing we learn really up front, uh, I learned when I was going to churches, uh, pastors said, well, you know, we want to, <coughs> excuse me, announce that you're coming. Uh, what do we want to put in the bulletin coming? I say, and I'll tell them, I say, whatever you do, don't say anything about special need because people automatically go to the lake. It not have anything to do with me. I'm, you know, I'm not going to be there. They're talking about special needs, and that don't have anything to do with that. So I just tell them, don't mention special needs. And so we learned that. And, and in fact, God gave me, um, I, we go to this camp. I'm not sure if you ever, it's been going on now for 45 years in Virginia, uh, Virginia Baptist Association. It's, a, it's an adult special needs retreat. Uh, and back in 2006, I believe it was, after we started the ministry in 2003, I got invited to go and to teach the parents as they come. And um, it, was a, uh, it was a watershed event for me. There was about 500 special needs adults and their caregivers at a retreat at a Eagle Irie above Lynchburg, Virginia. I don't know if you've ever wow. been there. Beautiful place up there. Oh, yeah. And, um, and it's a weekend. And uh, I learned so many things that first that we've been going ever since, but I learned so much. And, and what happened to me as I left that day, we're driving out my wife, Lee, and I was troubled. And Lisa, what's, it, what's, what's, what's the deal? I said, well, I said, let me tell you, I believe if the church in America were more like the people I've just been with this week, that's what I want to be like. I want to be like them because they loved on each other and they didn't care if your shirt was untucked or your hair was crazy or they just didn't care. And I learned so much. And, and she gave me, she said, you know, there's not, there's a purity about that. Isn't there? And I said, yeah, there is. And, uh, and over the next few months, as I ran and prayed, 
uh, God gave me this term to hopefully sort of alleviate some of the problems of, again, with special needs there, people say that doesn't apply to me. So what can we do to sort of disarm people as we go in? And so we said, well, pure. And so what it is is an acronym. And God, he again, gave it to me. I wish I was smart enough to read this up, but it's not me. But it, the P stands for perfectly created by a loving, sovereign God. And that flies right in the face of many people's doctrine. They say, well, God couldn't have done this. You know, God wouldn't do that. Well, yes, he did. Absolutely. And, he, and he's perfectly sovereign. That person is not a mistake. They're Amen. perfectly created by this loving, sovereign God. And we don't understand that. We don't understand the pain that's associated with it. We don't understand any of it, but it's nonetheless true. So that's one issue. The next one is unique. You stand for unique. Uniques and gifts and talents and desires and contributions they can make to the body of Christ and to the world as a whole. And so because everybody thinks that uh, somebody with cerebral palsy or somebody with Down syndrome, because they have shared tendency to have behaviors and physical characteristics, that they're all the same. Um, and what a tragedy that is for me to think that every person that I meet that has a certain disability is the same as every other person. They're not, they're unique. Um, the R stands for receptive and responsive to our touches and acts of love. And that speaks to us personally that we're all responsible according to the scriptures. We're not, we're not, we don't leave this to the special needs parent. We don't leave this special needs. God's given us the blessing of being able to interact and love on people that have disabilities that are different from that. And what we learn from that is unbelievable. And finally, uh, the last thing, uh, the E stands for eternal. And uh, our sort of slogan, we, Bob, we, we learned from Jim Pearson. I don't know if you remember Jim Pearson, the great, great hey, man. Yep. Uh, Jim always said, there's no disabled soul. There's no such thing as a disabled soul. And so that's a, that is a mandate. It's almost an indictment to the church is we cannot leave these people out because they don't meet our standards of what you're supposed to be or what you're supposed to do in the body of Christ. And in reality, when you get back and look at it, I know, Doc, you can understand this and for parents that are listening today. These people, regardless of the uh, number of disabilities or the severity of them, these people have abilities and can touch people in ways that whole people cannot. Amen. Uh, to not have them in our bodies because it makes us feel uncomfortable is a horrible thing for the church. So that's the whole point. We wanted to do the blessings. And so today, um, just uh, briefly sort of go through this. And one of the things I do in this seminar, um, and I'll, I'll briefly do it, but uh, the, the title is When We All Don't Live Happily Ever After, it's helping families deal with disabilities. And I don't know how many families are working today, but one of the things we started to realize and we saw in our own family, our own extended family, is when Zach was born, a lot of people, a lot of people in the family, most people in the family, really gathered around and were willing to um, make the adjustment and to um, change the, and to humble themselves and submit themselves to learn to deal with Zach. And they did that because they loved it. Okay? They didn't know him yet, but they, they did that. Um, but a lot of people, in the end, parents that are listening, um, there's very often, in fact, it's almost 100%, there's, there's always a mother or a dad or a sister or a brother or brother-in-law or sister-in-law or aunt or uncle who can't deal with it. Uh, and again, you were mentioning autism. That's particularly true when a child looks normal physically but behavior exactly. in such a way that you know well you're just not parenting right well, right what a horrible horrible thing to say you know uh when they have no they have no and we had in, in our family my my son-in-law's mom who was a caring loving person she missed four and a half years of Zach because she could not see herself as the grandmother of a special needs child yeah. And I remember sitting at his funeral, um, grieving and mourning, and yet at the same time, so happy for Zach. Um, that I thought, I was, behind me, I said, you know, it is so sad. This lady missed this little boy who came to this earth and was so important because she just didn't want to deal with it. And so she just sort of stayed 
kept her distance. And one I would like to talk about today is how do we deal with those people uh, in our family? And, um, and, you know, I always paint the picture of a, of a young mother. And here she is. She's given this devastating news that, to them that, you know, your child has X, Y, Z disability, you know, and automatically, and you know this, Doc, because you're a dad, uh, all those dreams, preconceived notions of what parenthood is going to be, what you're going to be doing with your son or daughter, they're shattered, okay? They're not what you thought it was going to be. And uh, so you're trying to deal with that. And you're also trying to deal with learning, uh, depending on what the, the disability is. You know, what is what do I need to do to care? What do we do as a couple to care for this child? And uh, what is, what, go ahead. Do you have a, no, no. Okay. Uh, so what are we going to do? And then to make matters really, really bad is uh, this young this young mother's mom or her best her, her best friend who happens to be her sister just can't deal with this that they, they don't they just make themselves scarce uh, they they just they're not there and so here we have this couple particularly a, a mom and her mom or her sister or her aunt who she's close to or her best friend just can't deal with this and so here she is in the uh, one of the most difficult times of her life um and she can't count on that person that she's loved and counted on her whole life. Yeah. And again, in our in our work, we found this to be true so, so often. And as I've done this seminar and other conferences across the country at different times, um, the room's full. A lot of times, these special needs moms. And then you, you then you crank in the fact that the high divorce rate and, and indictment against us men, many fathers leave. Right. You know, so here we are alone. Uh, we have the situation that people aren't understanding what's going on. I don't understand what's going on. I don't know what God's doing to me. I have this son or daughter with this disability. What do I do? So one of the first things I try to do in this seminar, and I paint that picture, and uh, I tell people this is sort of a wake-up call. I said, what I want you to know is that as we talk about this today, I'm not going to talk about them, Okay. And I'm not going to give you, if you came into the, if you came today to listen, or if you came into it when I'm doing this, and you want me to tell you the magic words to say, how to say it, you probably already said it to them, you know, to make this go away and to make them to respond the way you think they should and the way you expect them to, you need to leave because there aren't those words. Right. Okay. There, there's nothing that anybody can tell you, certainly not me, to say, I can tell you how to frame it, the situation, how to get there, just to tell them in a certain way that, you know, you've disappointed them and, you know, you, they, you need to be more, you know, this is your, this is your grandson or granddaughter, or this is your niece, or, you know, you, you need to do this. And then magically things change. It ain't going to happen. So if that's what you're looking for, I would say people listening today, I don't have it. I don't have right. it. What we are going to talk about is you, um, mom, uh, me, granddad, dad. Um, what is it that we do, okay? And we can only look to the scriptures um, to, to know what, what we should say. And in Colossians 3, it talks about, oh, you know, probably the hardest thing we do as Christians is forgive. And particularly when people don't even know what they've done to hurt so much is to forgive them without them saying a word and forgive them when they don't change, okay? Uh, to me, that's, I think that's really one of the reasons God talked about the 70 times seven we're to forgive people. It's right. for giving them for something because they don't even know it. And normally you think, well, if I pour my heart out to someone and they say, oh, I didn't understand I was doing this, you know, I'm going to change and, and everything. And that's when the part of the, the, thing we're talking about we don't live happily ever after in that mode it doesn't happen uh, so what do we do um and and the the problem comes um i mentioned it earlier this problem of pride that we have you know we're called as believers to if you if you just look there's only uh i guess i think really one time and i just wrote a great book and it just really talks about this is it talks about 
gentle and lowly. Jesus describes himself really only, he described himself many times in symbols uh, and other words that are somewhat abstract. But the only two adjectives he uses in Matthew 11 is he says, I am meek and lowly or gentle and lowly. And so what that really is reflecting for me as a special needs mom, and my mom is disappointing me, she's not there, is I've got to get to the point that I can, one, forgive them, okay? Set aside my pride and come to be like Christ, to have him through the Holy Spirit, to empower me to be meek and to be lowly and to let his Holy Spirit empower me to do that because you can't do it in the flesh. I can guarantee you, you cannot do it in the flesh. Uh, again, there are not words that I can say. Do you know how you hurt me when this happened and you weren't there, when I needed you and you weren't there? It doesn't help. You know, it just doesn't help. But this is the key, to, I really believe, to all of this. And we'll talk about some things that have to happen. Is, And we have to do this with everyone, but it's particularly appropriate in this situation. We have to accept people for who they are not who we want them to be, not who they should be, but for who they are. And that means lots of times we have a more superficial relationship with people than we want. And the problem is our expectations. We just feel like, you know, particularly as Christians, and um, we expect our dad and our mom and people to have to be a certain way. And then we always follow that expectation, expectation was it we deserve it, you know, we deserve it. At least we deserve a loving, caring mother. At least we deserve blah, 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 blah. We fill in the blank. Well, we don't, you know, and we're told that our expectation is from the Lord, okay? That's what we expect. We expect it from him, but we don't deserve any of this stuff, you know, and grace is what God gives us all. He gives it to us, but we don't deserve it. Just like salvation, just like any other thing that he uses any other characteristic he builds in us, he sanctifies us, we don't deserve it all, it all comes through grace. And so we have to be able to get to the point, uh, as hard as it is, to love my mother, even though she is not who I expect or want her to be. I love her where she is and, and through that love. And so what I really do is that we find ourselves in a situation and some people have gotten to the point and this happens a lot too. Um, we're in this situation, someone's greatly disappointed us. The problem is, particularly with the family, is that this person, you, you could write them off. And sometimes that happens. You know, just a card at Christmas, right. uh, phone call sometime. The problem with that is, they're gonna always be your mother, or they're always gonna be your sister, or they're so always true. your dad. They're going to be that. You have that relationship family relationship that's there. And it's almost true with close friends as well, even though it's not a family. They're going to be there. You can write them off, but what is it? what does it gain? So if you don't, what do you do? What is it that you actually can do? And that's that's sort of the, 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 the gist of what I wanted to talk about was that we have these, you know, I really say there's uh, 10 things uh, that we can do. And, um, Again, the, the, the first, the very first thing is that um, we have to leave our hurt and our disappointment and our expectations at the foot of the cross. Mm. And that is not a. Um, it's hard. It's it's not easy to do. Yeah. Um, and it's easy to say, you know, I'll just okay, I can do that. I can just I can just pretend. It's not pretending. We have to, in our heart through the power of the Holy Spirit who enables me to do this, to forgive that person and then just lay it all for the call. Just leave right. it there. And not carry it with me and say, you know, the next the next time you are in a situation where you just wish that your mom was there or you wish that that person who disappointed you so was there, you say, well, you know, we have to accept them who they are. And and really this is the, the, a side to that. The other side of that is that we have to understand that they're missing the blessing of your child. No, they're sure. missing what you're learning and have learned and what God is teaching you through this child. They're missing it. So really, we turn from a position of pride and hurt to 
wow, I, you know, I'm just going to pray that they can see him or see her as they are and that God can touch them through my son or daughter. Yeah. So it's a big deal. Um, so we lay it all at the foot of the cross. We, for, we forgive them. And that is so hard to do. I can, I can share a personal experience I have, we've had going on in my own life. Um, I, I, Zach died in 2003. Uh, we had three children. Uh, my son died in 2010, uh, unexpectedly with a heart attack at 34. Wow. Zach's mom, Katie, our firstborn, the apple of my eye, died very unexpectedly in 2013. Hmm. So we have three children, two are with the Lord. But in that, um, my daughter's death, my son-in-law remarried uh, very quickly, and it was just hurtful for us in the family. I just share that with you. I'm opening it up to you. It was so hurtful to us in the family. And um, it was just too much, too fast. And life went on. And it's just been a real issue with me. But I had to forgive that. I mean, I can't I can't stop. I can't change I, things. I had to forgive. And I can tell you right now, even the loss of Katie was not as hard as having to forgive them hmm. uh, as life went on. So you know, I don't, I don't pretend to think that that's easy. It's just a very hard thing to do. And you cannot do it in yourself. In your flesh, you cannot do it. God has to have to. That's the reason I'm so troubled by, by especially these parents who aren't believers or aren't getting, aren't in churches and fellowship and associated with believers to learn these things from us. Absolutely. Uh, but, um, and then probably, you know, what do we do with our expectations of what these people are supposed to be? And I think another thing we have to do is turn our expectations over to God. Mm -hmm. okay. it's, it's not us who define what we deserve. It is God who gives us what he wants us to have to grow us. If we just get to the point of understanding that, yes, God is sovereign. Yes, God loves us. Yes, God wants the very best for us. And he really wants us to be close to him. And I've thought back to the many times before Zach was born. I just thought, you know, my relationship now with the Lord is so much deeper because of what he did through what the world calls a tragedy. And it wasn't a tragedy. You know, Zach runs in heaven today. I'm here on earth left, longing to be with him and my daughter and my son, but I'm here. Right. My expectations have changed greatly because of him. And God can only do that. We can't just magically make up our mind and will ourselves to do it. Um, right. As we do that, we also, um, I mentioned this earlier when that child is born. And uh, I can just remember, and, and Doc, you maybe can too, and um, going through the early years of your son's life, I just remember going to church and going into Sunday school or something and talking with friends. And they were saying stuff like, you know, I'm so tired. Uh, my grandson had a uh, baseball game, you know, and then my granddaughter, I went to a dance recital and, you know, and, I, and, and I'll be honest with you, I want to punch him out, you know? And I just want to say, if you understood what I, you know, that I was Zach, we were doing that with Zach. I, I would, I would love to be that tired for doing those kind of things with, but realizing right. That, that wasn't going to happen. And as, in dealing with so many special needs families, um, just talking about as life goes on, and God is so good and so gracious about not bringing that all to our minds and our heart initially. It happens over time. And it happens, these waves of grief come over. And yet the waves of grace cover up that grief. But I'm talking about when you realize that maybe your son's not going to be able to um, go to school, yep. wait, typically, uh, or maybe they can go to school for a while. And then, you know, you realize your daughter is not going to get married. Uh, those things you don't just think all of a sudden, but they come over you in a new wave of grief. And the only solution to that is the grace of God. Mm -hmm. And he's saying, yeah, but do you realize that um, God is there. Do you feel his presence? And he's doing something greater to your child than maybe the quote unquote normal person gets to do. So I'm not saying it's easy. 
But I'm right. saying that realization occurs that the results and the things you think about life and what your child is going to experience, maybe what you've experienced, the normal kinds of events in life, they're going to be different. Okay, they're going to not. And, and initially, you think, well, that's bad, but it's what God has, we get back to the sovereignty of God, it's what God has ordained. Um, right. And um, another thing that we do is we deal with people, and, and, and this is happening when uh, we think we've dealt with our loved one that has not responded lovingly, but we keep bringing it, we keep bringing it back up with them. And again, I have a personal experience with my son. My son, our two daughters were um, born to my wife. We adopted our son in the middle, and he was always trouble. Uh, he always was in trouble. Um, we dealt with him just so many things, and <clears throat> he was in the middle of two high-performing sisters, and he just struggled with life. And um, at, in his teenage years, he left. He served some time in jail and just, you know, uh, wasn't a pretty sight. But I was convinced that the next time I saw him, I was going to be able to say the right words in the right sequence, in the right setting. I was going to check him. And he was going to respond and let me that son that I'm not supposed to. Um, we had to, and the reason I know that, I know that every time I saw him. Hey, David, real, David, real quick, your, your speaker kind of just gave out a little bit. I'm not sure. Yeah. Better, just talk louder. Uh, it sounds like you're in a tunnel. I don't know what I wish I knew what I did. Um, I don't know what I wish I knew what I did. Um, we lost your video. Can you, hear me, can you hear me any better? Yeah, that's good. You're back. Okay. And video's back too? Yep, you're back. All good. Okay. Okay. Sorry about that. Anyway, I knew that every and, and Gabe, my son knew. And he really didn't want to be with me because he knew I was going to hit him over the head with it every time. And God, only the last two years of his life, he convinced me. God spoke to me and says, you know, just be his dad. And so I shut up and I did what I'm um, encouraging people to do is just don't bring it up again. Yeah. Just don't bring up that and he knows, she knows, whoever you're talking to, they know that deep down inside, they could have done more to help you as a mother or dad during those early years, but they're coming around. But they do something to hurt again, don't bring it up again. You've left it at the foot of the cross. And when I said that about leaving it at the foot of the cross, really leave it, really leave it there. Um, and then we have to, this is the, getting some hard issues right here. Because particularly with um, the situation we're talking about, but it's applicable in many situations, we have to value the relationship we have with this person more than just being right. Okay? Um, and you can apply that so many places and so many situations. You can be adamant. You can be correct. You can be scripturally correct. And you can beat people over the head with it to the point that you destroy your relationship and any ability you have to influence them or lead them to the Lord, anything else. And so it's just so hard to do. Um, how do I do that? How do I value relationship more than being right? And I, I, I like to use my sister, who is one of the most godly people I've ever known, three sons and a daughter. Uh, one of her sons um, is homosexual. My sister is one of the most godly women I know. And she has handled this in such a way that I probably wouldn't. I would have probably been on the hill the day that I found out. But she has said, you know, he is my son. He knows I don't approve of any of what he's doing, but I'm going to love him anyway. And it's particularly appropriate again in our situation that we're talking about today where I'm the mother and dad, and my dad has so disappointed me in how he has not participated in loving my child, um, what do I do? You know, what do I do? Do I again, bring it up or what do I do? And, and all I'm saying there is value the relationship of being right. And 
doesn't mean we compromise to sin. My, my, my sister cannot change her son. She doesn't have the power. And we talked about her. She doesn't have the power. Exactly where she stands. But she doesn't have the power to change it. Her only option is to marry the relationship. Okay. Uh, it, your, your, your speaker's kind of going out again. I don't even know what I did. Okay. Uh, we'll make it work. Better now? No, nah, just go ahead. Okay. We'll make it work. Uh, the other thing we have to do is be willing to be misunderstood. And uh, it sort of goes with another uh, one of these things. We must be willing to be embarrassed. Uh, if we love people and we pay the relationship, people may look at us and say, you know, that person is not real, they're not real Christians. And I'm, I'm thinking about people, again, I'm using my sister as an example. People would look at her and say, you know, she just, she's compromised her faith and her sin. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, she's not, no, she's has No, it's her son. And she's, she has taken the option, the only option that's available to her without alienating her son or cutting off the relationship with son, she has been, been willing to be misunderstood or even embarrassed. I recall one of the situations with my son. Uh, I was in Hall County Courthouse with him and him being in charge or something. And I was in court with him. And I had friends in our town in North Georgia. Uh, lawyers and judges who were coming, oh, Dave, what are you doing here today? Uh, and I didn't know exactly what to say. Um, but we have to be willing to be in situations that we never thought we would be. And I think that is so appropriate with special needs parents. One of the things I mentioned the camp that up at Eagle Iron, one of the things that impressed me so was to see these dads, they may be construction workers or anything else. They would be on the stage with their sons dancing around in these skits that they were doing, you know, humiliating themselves. Yeah. Are we willing to be able to do that? You know, are we willing to do that or is our persona or our self-image such that we can't? And as Christians, as Christian parents of special needs people, particularly blessed with a special needs child, a pure child, as we call them, we just, we just have to be willing to, you know, God, you put me where you want me to be. I'll, I'm, I'm willing to do that. And I'm willing to embrace that because it's what you're calling me to do. Um, the, um, and we just, we just finally, we, we find ourselves and we also have to be willing to suffer the consequences. And we know about that. You know, you know that you, there are things that you're paying the price for your loved ones, lack of care and love for you and your family. You have to, lots of times you're, you're the one to pay the consequences. They're paying consequences they're not even aware of, but a lot of times you're paying that price. You have to be, we have to be, there's nothing more sacrificial than paying the price for other sins. Is that not what Jesus did? In such a way that we can never identify enough with that. But when we're paying the price, and I thought about myself, and again, I'm not trying to be, I don't know, I'm not trying to be arrogant or something, but I, I just remember standing there in that court one day before a judge that I knew, and I thought, I never thought, I, I never thought in a million years I'd be standing here. But here I am. What am what am I to do with this? Am I to just sort of pretend it doesn't exist or whatever? Can't do it. Um, and then finally, you know, as we talk through all of these issues, and I sort of run through them sort of in a hurry, but um, as we talk through these issues, you know, it gets back down to a, to something that I think is important in all of our lives, in all of our time, um, in all situations. But we really uh, I think the fact that when we have a, a special needs child and all of these situations that God allows to happen in our lives, once again, to grow us because he loves us and he wants the best for us. Um, I get have to get to the point sometimes. Where I say, do I really trust God? Do I really or am I just pretending? Um, am I playing a game or am I really trusting him and his word? And I'm telling you, that is a sobering moment when we can um, get to the point 
and we ask ourselves that question and we respond, yes. Yeah, I trust you, God. I trust what you, I don't understand it. I wouldn't have done it this way. Right. Um, but you know what's best for me. You know what is to draw me close to you. And that's what I desire. I desire to be closer. You desire the technique and the methods you're going to use to do that. And it may not be fun. I, I talk about this in, in my book. Um, and I talk about it with kids, that are, uh, pure kids and um, people with different abilities. And, and, you, and you know this, people can come up and, and they can really be dumb. They can really say stupid things. Amen. Uh, and and, and if we, we pretend that this special needs child, 10 years old, um, doesn't hear what you're saying. Like somehow it's, it's, you know, they don't hear, they don't, they don't understand what well, they do. And they do, they might not understand it completely. But I talk about in my book about what if you, me, if we were that special needs person and our life, we've heard talked about around me and I heard it. Uh, I don't understand all the implications of it, but they talk about me as a person being a tragedy. My identity is being a tragedy to these people I love, my mom and my dad. And they talk about me being a tragedy. How tragic is that? As opposed to we talk about the quote unquote normal kid, the typical kid, who's always, the kids are our blessings. And here, that child somehow is understanding or in any way um, appreciating this opinion of someone that they're tragedy. You know, I can't think of anything sadder in my life. And as we talk about the ways that, you know, we interact with people and the way we interact with special needs people. And I, again, just talk, how, you know, how do you do that? What do you do? Well, you just humble yourself. You, you, you make yourself vulnerable and you just, you just say, God, I'm going to go up and speak to this person. Um, and you may do something stupid, but if you do it with the right attitude, you do it with, with love and uh, the right perspective. Um, it's great. I always tell you know, people, people ask me when Zach was around, um, I, I get to our preacher who was one of my best friends, you know, when he was around Zach and he would pick him up and love on him, he would just scream in his ear. And one day, one day, Katie, his mom said, you know, preacher, you know, he's, he's not deaf, <laughs> you know, but we associate with every special needs person, every physical disability that could possibly, right. you know, we talk loud, we talk slow, you know, and uh, all kinds of things like that. And, and, and that's okay. I mean, it really is. It's okay. They understand that. They just know that you're talking to them. You're not pretending they don't exist. You're not looking somewhere else. And I, and I'll, I'll sort of close with this because I know our time's running out. But when, when God was wrestling with me about starting this after Zach died, um, I, I was just, you know, I was, I felt like God was calling me to do this. And Katie was, my daughter was saying we should do this. But I just, you know, I didn't know. And so I was in a Walmart in Daytona Beach, Florida. And I went in with my wife to get a few things. And uh, God, God uh, told me that, and I can, I can remember, he said, watch. So my wife goes off to the store, and about that time, this group home comes in, and they had a couple of chaperones, there were five or six of them. And in my pre-Zach days, I would have hightailed it out of there. I would have ignored them. But I, God says, follow, watch this. And so I spoke to them all, and, they were just well behaved, real nice. And they, they went through that Walmart and I would, I was behind them. I just sort of stayed a distance behind them, watched them go through there. And it was really unbelievable to experience what they experienced on a daily basis. I saw them go down an aisle and I saw someone come in on the other end of the aisle and look up and immediately go back out of that aisle. They wouldn't come down there. And I watched them go through and it was sort of like, um, uh, I don't remember if you if you're old enough to remember Get Smart, the old TV. Oh, yeah. Well, you know the cone of silence. Uh huh. Like these people had a, a cone built around them, and yeah. they were, you know, deflecting everybody coming near. I watched them go through that Walmart. They were there for probably twenty minutes. Mm -hmm. Not a single person, not a single person spoke to them. 
Not a single person acknowledged that they existed, except the girl that was checking him out. She had to. But they went through that whole store and I thought, what is that I've seen here? You know, and but it, it but it but it convinced me just watching that is that there's there's just such a need. And and Doc, and I can I say this, and I say this to pastors, you know what I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. If churches can get down on the level or in fact get up to the level of a person with disabilities because we, we tend to think that we have to lower ourselves to communicate in a certain way but in spiritual times we're really we have to get up to that level can god empower me to get me on the floor to speak to that little boy who can't lift his head can god empower me can he remove the pride in my heart to get me there can right. he do it? Absolutely. Um, and if you can do that to churches, when churches have those people in them, the blessings uh, that and the things that that person can just, they don't have to say a word. God's working through them to change the body of Christ in ways that you and I can. Right. We can talk about these things. They can radiate it through the Holy Spirit. Um, so I'm, I tell churches, you know, you want to grow, you want to be something special, have pure kids, have pure people in your body, have them serving in your body, having people who are uncomfortable, make them comfortable, help them accommodate. We, mm -hmm. we accommodate for every, every kind of thing in our church. And, and I, I make a joke and I use an example. What if I go into your church today and I say, I walk up there and I'm new and I say, what do you have for ball people here? You know, do you have any you have any special ministers for bald people? Because you know, you can say I'm balling. This is my my kids right here. They're bald. They're not bald, but they're with a the bald person. You have something, and it's almost that crazy. We try to say, you know, really special needs ministry. That just it should just be the fabric of your church. It doesn't have to be thought of as a special program. But you just make accommodations. You accommodate, and don't just accommodate in a negative term but you embrace and you have them in all the life of your body. What do you have to do to include these people in your body? Because we've just done talked about today. So many times they've been hurt. So many times they've been hurt by other churches. They've been hurt even in their family. They've been hurt with their friends. What can you do? What can we do as the body to lovingly embrace, include, put in positions of leadership, help these people integrate into our body not as pure people just they're just brothers and sisters in christ is who they are right so that's my encouragement as i sort of end this today um yeah that is to i would i would encourage people to to um we we try to do this just encourage people to don't call don't call somebody by their disability don't even say don't even say they're disabled and certainly don't say they're retarded or any of those other negative kinds of things. I'll end with this. When we first started introducing this church, uh, I was called to, uh, I'd done a seminar somewhere, and these two ladies were in from Gainesville, Florida. And about six months later, they called me and said, Would you come and preach at our uh, Pure Sunday? And I said, You're what? She said, we're having a pure Sunday at our church, a big Baptist church in Gainesville, Florida. I said, shoot, yeah, I'll be there. So I went there and they started telling me that the service is going to start. They were going to have a um, uh, a dad speak uh, about what pure ministry had been in that church. That's what they'd call it. And, and it was a tremendous testimony. He was a lawyer and he had a son, severely autistic like you, and he just distance himself you know he was just became disconnected worked longer just didn't participate and he said he went by the church and he saw that and they got involved in the ministry and he god started working on him and showing him you know what where he was and what god was doing with his son and became involved and got back as being the dad and it was just a tremendous testimony uh, i mean it was a fantastic i could have left and then they said you know we had a, a little video that we showed and at the end of this video, we had a number of pure people at our church in Gainesville. And all they said was, they, was, they said, I'm a pure person. I'm a pure person. 
little had a little box, you know, they used a, a, a I forgot what it's called, audio box thing. I am a pure person. The little boy had typed that in. And they just had a bunch of these. And so unbeknownst to anybody, that video ended. The auditorium was dark. I started walking to the front and all of a sudden we started hearing these people in the audience, kids standing up. I'm a pure person. I'm a pure person. I'm a pure person. Well, I got it in the front. I said, hey, we can go home. You know, there's nothing I can say other than the fact. When is the last time you heard your child, you pure parents, proudly proclaim who they were? Love it. You know, they identified with that. They said, that's good. That's better than being autistic or crippled or any of the other terms that the world judged them. So I would just encourage people, if, you, if you're not familiar with it, um, it's, it's people that it doesn't mean that they're seriously pure. We know they're not, but uh, some definitely are. They, they don't have the ability to sin. They yeah. don't have, they can't. But yeah. it, it means that in a sense, in God's sight, they're pure. Okay. by that definition but I thank you I thank you for the time amen well a couple of things thank you so much David uh, wonderful words uh, great wisdom fully agree with everything you said and and you know one, one thing I'll just throw out there again for any church and ministry leader listening kind of piggybacking on what David said I'm sorry it's a biblical mandate to welcome families with disabilities into the church look at Luke 14. Jesus commands it not once, but twice to welcome individuals with disabilities into the church. Why? Because the church needs those with disabilities just as much as those with disabilities need the church. Disability ministry is no longer an elective for the church. It is now a requirement. And, every, and that's for every church. It's not just the church down the street. It doesn't matter the size of the church. Every single church needs to welcome. It doesn't mean you have to have a huge ministry, it means you're able to welcome whoever walks through your doors and not turn them away. And when you serve an individual with disabilities, it's not just that individual, you serve the entire family. That's where disability ministry changes. It's serving the parents, it's serving the siblings, it's serving the grandparents, uh, just like David said here. And so it's, it's taking that into approach and it affects every single ministry. It can even go to, to your worship pastor. Instead of saying, would everyone please stand and join us, saying, simply saying, if you're able, would you please stand and join us? You now just made it inclusive for them. So that's one thing there. Um, and, and David, you know, uh, I've got a couple other things, but I, we've got a question that came in. I'm going to let you think about it while I, I share a couple other things. The question is, um, one of our listeners, um, she's going home for Thanksgiving. She's a single mom, has a four-year-old child with autism, and her mom just does not understand why her four-year-old with autism cannot behave, she put in quotation marks, the way her other grandkids does. And so treats them differently. And, and like I've had, you know, blames the mom for par par poor parenting. Um, what would you have to tell her? So think about that for a minute. The other comment I want to say, um, going along with what you've said, David, I firmly believe individuals with disabilities, they're not the ones disabled. We are. And, and the reason for that, every single individual I know with a disability or special needs, they see straight to the heart. They don't mm -hmm. see color. They don't see ability, disability. They don't see any of that other garbage that we see. We, we have to see sex. We see gender. We see socioeconomic. You know, we, we see everything. We see any disability. And we immediately make those judgments, just like that whole story. People not going down the road because adults with disabilities were there. That is wrong. We're the ones disabled because we have the wrong makeup. We're thinking wrong. If you want to be truly blessed and see more what it would be like to be around God, be around individuals with disabilities because they have such an amazing relationship with God. They're truly, you know, in, in line with what God teaches and, and we believe that's, that will just fill you up. And that's how we all need to be. We don't, we need to stop this and saying, you know, there's, there's these people and there's these, 
We're all together. We are all creating the image and likeness of God, period. You know, and, and, you know, it's, it needs to be the church period for everybody. It's not just those of certain, we need to welcome everybody. So in families, you know, it goes back to what David said, we're blood and we got to accept one another. Um, and, and that comes alongside them. Even if you don't understand, try to walk in someone else's shoes before you make any other judgment. Um, cause you have no idea how hard life is. I, as a pediatrician treating many families with disabilities did not fully understand it until I became a parent. And that's when my eyes were opened. And all of a sudden you can't go out on a date night because you just can't get the neighbor girl to come in. So, you know, realize that. But uh, with that, um, David, let me, you know, go back to you um, with, with this question. How can we um, help um, uh, the, this lady with her, her, her four-year-old with autism and dealing with grandma at Thanksgiving time? Any suggestions? Well, you may be you may be better equipped to answer this question than me. And again, there's no real answer. I think what they'll be looking at always is how we as the parent deal with it. You know, if we act embarrassed or we're trying to, um, I guess, not pretend, but we're trying, we're just embarrassed with our son or our daughter. We don't want to do that. We don't want them to see that. I think over, they're not going to change. They're going to think you're still a bad parent because you're just doing this behavior. But you lovingly deal with that child as best you can and not be affected in your heart about what that person may think. Hopefully they're going to think, you know, how, how, how does she do this? How is she lovingly dealing with it? And I know that's hard because sometimes you're not going to lovingly deal with it. You get frustrated and I understand all of that. But I think over time, how you deal with your child and these moments of, of behavior and so forth, I think they start to learn that. They start to see how do you have that patience? How do you have that love with someone behaving this way? Right. And maybe they'll learn from that. And one other thing before we go today, I would just, you just, you said it so good just now, Don, and how really the way pure people view the world and how they view each other, how they view us. And this became, this was talking about pride. I have friends at this camp in Eagle Iron I went to, and I saw a bunch, three or four guys talking together. And one of the, one of the, you know, I'm really close to one of them. And I went up to him, and we don't realize we have this pride, but I went up to him, they think, I, I kept thinking, Hey, this is me. This is David Glover. I'm coming up here to these four pure guys, you know, and they're having this conversation and everything. Well, my friend, he stopped, he hugged me, he introduces me. And then I thought we'd dwell on me for a little while. You know, I'm the normal one here in the group. I'm the guy that, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm not special me. Well, they went back talking among themselves. And I just stood there and I thought, that's tremendous. You know, I wasn't special. I wasn't just because I wasn't quote unquote disabled. They looked at me as just somebody else. They were caring and loving me. But these, hey, these were four friends talking. You know, they included me. Yeah. They didn't exalt me. We have to right. quit thinking we should be exalted among people with special needs. We should be humble and abased almost. And uh, so what you just said was they are gifted in the sense that they look at people without those filters. They look at who you are. Are you going to love on me or not? You know, that's a simple thing. And they don't fake it you now, so which which I love. Um, no. So so let me just piggyback on the question that was asked um, there on, on how to deal with grandma. Um, you know, Im important thing I'd say, never apologize for your child. Um, you know, again, they're created on purpose, for a purpose. There's nothing wrong with them. And, and we need to help do that. A lot of times we feel like we need, we need to make excuses and apologize. No, we need to help educate. Um, I know a lot of families, you know, they actually have created, especially for kids with autism, because that's where we see a lot, like David mentioned earlier, if you got the face of a neurotypical child, people expect them to behave normally. Well, when they're behaving poorly, you know, someone says something or they're staring, they actually pull out a, a card that says, um, Thank you. My child has autism. 
I would love assistance if you could help me or, or something like that. Or for more information, they have a, a website that they can go to learn about autism. So that's just education there. But one of the things, maybe just sit down with, with grandma and just tell her what life is really like for you. Um, because sometimes they don't fully understand that. Um, my parents are fully, you know, uh, were fully receptive with my son, Mark, and accepted him. But it wasn't until we were out in public uh, and my dad especially saw the way that other people were gawking and looking and making comments about my son that he realized what we deal with all the time. That opened his eyes and he took that personally. Um, and so that really helped him uh, totally get, get on our side, but it helps open those because until you live it, you don't understand it. So just letting them know and, and letting mom, letting grandma know how she can become close because part of it a lot of times is they're afraid. They don't know how to show the affection. They don't know if they can touch. They don't know what to do. And so just letting them know, hey, just be a friend, just try and just show uh, there with it. So that's all I do. And the most important thing, pray, 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 keep God in the center of it. And I promise you, God's going to help you through it. Um, but with that, you know, we, we could go on quite a bit. This has been a great topic. Uh, thank you so much, David. A couple of announcements I want to share with everyone. First off, our next Talk with Doc, we're taking off for Thanksgiving. And then our next one will be uh, December the 10th. Um, we're having our, our next talk, another great one. It's going to be preventing exhaustion and burnout. This is both as a parent and as a ministry leader. So it works for both. And our guests will be Stephanie Hubach and Lisa Mathis. Um, so two great, uh, great talks, uh, speakers there. Make sure you, you join us for that. Other thing I'm super excited about with SOAR, we are participating right now in SOAR Christmas Blessings. We have many families who are unable to provide Christmas for their family this year because of the economy. And so if you are interested in either as a individual or as a family, a small group at your church, a business to adopt families and provide Christmas, just not for the individual with disability, but the sibling and the parents. We're going to also do a gift card for the grocery store and a gas card. If you're interested in doing that, please contact us at info at soarspecialneeds.org. We'd love to get you uh, partnered up with a family. Help us be able to bless these families. They're not just in the greater Kansas City area. We actually have families from all over the country. Uh, we are going to be blessing with us. So let us know. We'd love to have you help with us. Um, but David, thank you again for being a part with us. Uh, can you just let everyone know how they can get hold of you and Pure Ministries if they want? Pure ministries.com and all the contact information on there. We'd love to uh, come and help churches any way we can and uh, on site or any other way that we can. So uh, I also have a book. I have a book that says um, it's called A Better Way, Released as Most, which talks a lot about from our perspective of uh, pure people and how the church can be involved. So either one of those would be fun. Awesome. Well, thank you so much. And everyone, I hope you come back with us next time. And always remember, come soar with us. Y'all have a great day. Thank you. <laughs>